pleased to have Dr. James Allison from the University of California, San Francisco, uh, with us today to share his expertise and to answer questions. Before we introduce Dr. Allison and get started, I want to share a few housekeeping items. Uh, in the chat box, you should see the CME uh, evaluation survey. This is the pretest. At the end of the session, we will, there will be a post-test as well. So if you would like CMEs for this session, please fill that out. Uh, and again, the webinar will still run in the background. Uh, Dr. Allison will take questions at the end of his presentation. So if anything comes up for you during the presentation, please hold your questions or type into the chat box. And again, we have everybody on mute so that we can minimize any background noise, but we will uh, allow people to ask questions at the end of the hour. Uh, next slide, please. Or actually, oh yeah, so for CMEs, um, again, these questions were reproduced with permission from in-practice clinical care options, and for credit, you will need to do both the pre and post evaluation. Next slide. In terms of disclosure, neither the main CDC colorectal cancer control program, the main primary care association, nor James Allison, MD, holds any financial interest in any of the products or models referenced in this program. There are no conflicts of interest, commercial support, endorsement of products, or off-label use recommendations. Funds for this project are made available through award number 5U58DP002063 from DHHS CDC and Prevention and the Maine Cancer Foundation. So without further ado, we are thrilled to have with us Dr. James Allison. He is a former Kaiser Permanente Medical Group physician who retired in 1998 after 24 years of service. He was a full-time gastroenterologist and educator at the Oakland Medical Center, where he devoted the majority of his time to patient care, administration, clinical research, and teaching. In 1996, he received the Lowell Beale MD Award in appreciation of his example of academic excellence combined with warm humanity. Since his retirement from TPMG, Dr. Allison has been a member of UCSF's faculty and an adjunct investigator at Kaiser Permanente's Division of Research. He is clinical professor of medicine emeritus at UCSF and a member of the Division of Gastroenterology at San Francisco General Hospital. In 2003, he received the Bay Area Chapter of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's Premier Physician Award. In 2004, the American Gastroenterological Association's Distinguished Clinician Award. And, uh, you know, not to shortchange Dr. Allison, but there are just so many accolades and um, citations that could go on forever, but I just would love to pass it off and voice our Sincere appreciation for sharing your knowledge uh, for so many clinicians here in Maine. So uh, take it away, Dr. Allison. Well, thanks so much, Caroline, for that introduction, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate all of you Mainers who dug out of your driveways to attend this webinar. I'd like to thank Christy, for inviting me, Christy Daggett for inviting me to speak this morning and acknowledge all the hard work both she and Caroline Zimmerman, Zimmerman did to make this webinar possible. The drive and dedication I have witnessed in the main colorectal cancer control group is exemplary, and it is an honor for me to help in any way I can. Now, my usual target audience has been the primary care physician, and I know there are quite a few on this call, and I'm hopeful that if you can agree with the statement on my first slide, there is no one best colorectal cancer screening test, that you will join me on this first day of March, Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, in my mission to increase screening rates in the uninsured, underserved U.S. population and to promote the importance of evidence and transparency in colorectal cancer screening guidelines. So here's how I'm going to do it this morning. <clears throat> the first, I'm going to talk about the colorectal cancer problem and screening as one solution. Polyps have a bad name in the United States. They're often overemphasized as to their importance. So I'm going to talk about what are precancerous polyps and how often are they fatal. I'm going to talk about the elephant in the screening test room, which I call optical colonoscopy, and describe how it got there. And then I'm going to pose the question and answer it, is there evidence that colonoscopy is the best or preferred colorectal cancer screening test? I'll then move on to the fecal immunochemical test and discuss how it could be a good screening test or even better than colonoscopy. 
I'll talk about the current screening, colorectal cancer screening guidelines that were last published in 2008, and we'll cover the American Cancer Society Multi-Society Task Force Guidelines, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force Guidelines, and the American College of Gastroenterology Guidelines. I'm going to make a statement that the U.S. is not a fit-friendly environment. I'll prove that. Then I'll act as FIT's lawyer and explain why all the charges are false, and then I'll talk about the consequences of looking at other tests as not good. I'll have a summary and conclusions. So here's the problem staring you in the face. This is a large colorectal cancer in the rectosigmoid. It's ulcerating. And though I can't tell you for sure without the histopathology, this is likely a stage four cancer. And this is not what we want to be finding. We want to be finding either early cancers or those adenomas or advanced polyps that are most likely to become cancer. So how big is the problem of colorectal cancer in the United States? Well, there is a high prevalence in patients age 50 years and older. In 2012, it was estimated there, will be, there would be 143,000 new cases and 51,000 deaths in the United States. It represents 9% of all cancer deaths in the United States. It's the third most common cause of cancer in women and men, and the third leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. And I highlight this last bullet point because 67,000 cases and 28,600 deaths occur in women in the United States yearly. And women mainly are concerned about breast cancer and about cervical cancer, but this shows that you need to be concerned about colorectal cancer as well. Well, how big is the risk to you of colorectal cancer in your life if you're an average risk patient? That is one who does not have any family history or other uh, kinds of history that would make you a candidate for uh, getting colorectal cancer. The lifetime risk of colorectal cancer in the U.S. approaches 6% for both men and women. I'm sorry. Almost 50% of those affected will die of this disease, and that's mainly because it's found in the late stage. But if you make it to age 50, at age 50, your lifetime risk is 5% of being diagnosed with colorectal cancer and 2.5% chance of dying from it. And this is an important bullet point I want you to remember, because this means that any test you use, you can, you'll apply to a patient 97.5 times with no effect in decreasing mortality to find the 2.5 that will. And when you use colonoscopy as that screening test, that's very expensive and perhaps not worth the money. So we're going to be talking about uh, sporadic cancer today. We're not, it's not that I don't think these other cancers are important, but the approach to their evaluation and uh, screening and surveillance, et cetera, is different from this group. And so we are only going to be talking about the largest part of this pie, and that is the sporadic or average risk patient. So we have these arguments for screening. In most cases, colorectal cancer develops slowly from an adenomatous polyp, a process which can take up to 10 years. It may take less than 10 years. It may take more than 10 years. They all vary. The polyps most likely to become cancers can be identified and removed, and this prevents cancers. And the detection of early stage cancers allow for colorectal cancer mortality reduction. So you want a screening test that can do both. Identify these polyps most likely to become cancer and detecting the early stage cancers so you can prevent death from colorectal cancer. This is a pictorial that shows the same thing I just told you, that basically you start out with a normal colon, you may develop a small adenomatous polyp, and then eventually some of these, but most of don't, become a cancer. The most important part of this slide is down here. 25% of the U.S. population by age 50 have polyps, and up to 50% of individuals will develop a colorectal adenoma or polyp in their lifetime. So if everybody who had polyps developed cancer, we would be taking care of only colorectal cancer in our hospitals. We wouldn't have room for anybody else. And this points out the fact that most people die with their polyps and not from their polyps. So let's talk about what polyps are because the, the, the naming of them in the gastroenterology literature is very scary. And I can tell you that many physicians don't understand this and many physicians, even clinical oncologists, don't understand this. But a polyp is a benign tumor that protrudes into the lumen of the colon. Adenomas are benign polyps derived from the lining of the colon. The term advanced adenoma refers to polyps of a certain size and a certain histology. They are not cancers, and the natural history of these lesions is unknown, but most do not become cancers. 
and the colonic neoplasms described in the gastroenterology literature as advanced are predominantly advanced adenomas, that is, they're benign, and very few are stage four cancers. So how likely are these polyps to kill you? Well, this will give you some of the information right here, but only 6% of these lesions will later develop into colorectal cancer. So huge numbers never do, and that's an important take-home point. So what we're dealing with here when everybody gets scared about a polyp, like Dr. Oz, is the phenomenon of overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis is labeling innocuous tumors cancer and treating them as though they could be lethal when, in fact, most are not even dangerous. You'll be interested to know that in April of 2011, a book review was published in JAMA entitled Overdiagnosed, Making People Sick in Pursuit of Health. And to uh, second that, um, Dr. Kramer, who is Associate Director for Disease Prevention at NIH, said, overdiagnosis is pure, unadulterated harm. So we have a problem in the United States. We have a compelling argument for screening. We have multiple effective screening tests that are available, and cost effectiveness is established for those that are evidence-based and guidelines published. But 40% of Americans of screening age have never been screened, and a disproportionate number of advanced cancers are found in the uninsured and underserved population. Now, I'm going to talk about how the elephant got in the room in just a minute, but in 2000, two articles were published in the New England Journal that talked about colonoscopy, and shortly thereafter, that was the only test that was really being considered in the United States. And by 2007, the NCI realized there was a problem and talked about the imperative of improving colorectal cancer screening. The NCI said, it's a troubling fact that colorectal cancer screening rates continue to lag well behind those for other cancers. The reasons behind this shortfall are complex, but there is widespread agreement that if significant improvement in colorectal cancer screening are to be realized, the primary care setting will be the most crucial contributor. That's a lot of you guys on this call. And as, early, as late as January in 2012, the CDC says something similar. Screening for colorectal cancer has increased over time, reaching in 20,000 uh, 2010, between 57 and 65 percent, but these estimates are considerably lower than the Healthy People Guideline uh, target of 71 percent. So now let's talk about how this colonoscopy elephant got into this screening room. In 2000, in the New England Journal, two articles were published that showed that if you do a colonoscopy on a patient, you'll find polyps and cancers. This was not uh, very revealing to those of us who are gastroenterologists and have been doing colonoscopy since the 1990s. But what happened afterwards was quite different. Before, 19, before 2000, it was considered the wrong thing to do to, to population screened with a colonoscopy, to look at somebody who had no symptoms and no, uh, no uh, positive tests that would lead us to believe they had colon cancer because the risks they felt were outweighed by the by the, the benefits were outweighed by the risks. And this was published in uh, 2000 in the New England Journal. And uh, at the same time, exactly the same time in 2000, the American College of Gastroenterology uh, came out with guidelines that said the same thing they did then as they, as they did when they were republished in 2009. Now, the American College of Gastroenterology are your clinical gastroenterologists. And they said colonoscopy every 10 years beginning at age 50 remains the preferred colorectal cancer screening strategy, not saying preferred by whom. And it is impractical for a PCP to discuss six different options for colorectal cancer screening with each patient. Recommending one preferred strategy simplifies discussion. Colonoscopy is the preferred strategy because it is the best test. And of course, I will show you that there is no proof that it is the best test. I do agree that a PCP has trouble describing six different options in the question and answer period, we can talk about how that might be accomplished. There aren't six different options anyway. Now at the same time as this publication uh, was published in the New England Journal, there was an editorial by a thought leader from the American Gastroenterology Association and a Harvard professor who, who started the, the roll call of people saying things about the other screening tests. And he said about flexible sigmoidoscopy the following. There is suspicion among physicians that in recommending flexible sigmoidoscopy to screen persons for colorectal cancer, we are promoting a suboptimal approach. Relying on flexible sigmoidoscopy is as clinically logical as performing mammography of one breast to screen women for breast cancer. And I have a brilliant, uh, a brilliant reply to that, uh, but I don't have time to show it to you unless we, you bring it up in the discussions. 
um, that was published in the gastrointestinal endoscopy of all, all journals uh, by uh, Dr. Deborah Fisher. And he said, the failure of insurance companies to cover the cost of colonoscopy screening is no longer tenable. Well, that's a pretty heavy duty message. Now, the other person who was very influential in getting people to think about uh, screening and screening with colonoscopy was Katie Couric. And other media people have also contributed. But Katie Couric was the best uh, of the people who did it and still is a great uh, uh, proponent of screening for colon cancer. Unfortunately for Katie, her husband died of colorectal cancer, but he was an outlier. He was not the kind of, uh, he, was, he doesn't really belong in the pie. I don't know why it was, he, he, was, uh, he got this at a younger age, but he did get it at a younger age and he died from it. And Katie went on this crusade and even had her own colonoscopy uh, televised on the Today Show and afterwards said it is considered the most effective test for detecting colon cancer and it really didn't hurt. Now, if you don't think that was uh, influential, you just have to look at this article in the Archives of Internal Medicine, and you'll see that after she did that, there was a large increase in population screening with uh, optical colonoscopy. So before 2000, uh, and this one wasn't in the room at that time, but before 2000, um, mostly screening was done by FOBT and by flexible sigmoidoscopy. And after 2000, the following happened. Uh, the optical colonoscopy became the elephant in the room, essentially um, pushing out all the other options as considerations by many in the United States. And if you don't think that's still going on in the United States, all you have to do is look at this slide. Last year, I presented at the Prevent Cancer Foundation in Baltimore, and on my way with a former mentee to dinner, I saw this on the building uh, in, uh, in, uh, of a hospital in Baltimore. And what does it say? It says, schedule your colonoscopy today. It's colorectal cancer awareness month. The message being get a colonoscopy, not be screened for colorectal cancer. And I would like you all to start thinking about this message over this message. So despite all of this uh, flurry of events that occurred in 2000, in the next eight years, there really wasn't any kind of uh, uh, guideline until 2008. There was a lot of discussion and uh, the need for a guideline, but uh, the only one that came out was the American College of Gastroenterology in 2000, which, as I told you, said colonoscopy is the best and the preferred test. But in 2008, there was a consortium that was formed from the American Cancer Society and what was called the Multi-Society Task Force. The Multi-Society Task Force is composed of uh, gastroenterologists and gastroenterology uh, uh, organizations such as the American College of Gastroenterology, the American Gastroenterology Association, the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and the other group that joined was the American College of Radiology. So this was assemblage of, of uh, people who were experts in the field but not necessarily experts in evidence. And they came up with new guidelines that were different from ones published in the past and they divided for the first time the recommended tests into two groups stool tests, and structural exams. So in the stool test, they recommended fecal cold blood testing, but for the first time, eventually, essentially said, standard guaiac test, the one you're all so familiar with, hemocol 2, is not a good test to be using. We should be using a sensitive guaiac, which is the same as the standard guaiac, except it detects lower levels of peroxidase activity or the fecal immunochemical test. And they also recommended the stool DNA test which unfortunately had not been approved by the FDA and subsequently is not even available in the United States. As for structural exams, they recommended double contrast perimetoma, flexible sigmoidoscopy, CT colonography, and colonoscopy. Now, embedded in this uh, document were these precautions regarding the menu of options. And they said, if fecal tests are used, the opportunity for prevention is both limited and incidental and not the primary goal of colorectal cancer screening with these tests. And what did they mean by that? They asserted that the fecal immunochemical tests, the new tests, do not find advanced adenomas. Those adenomas and polyps most likely to become cancer. And then they said, it is a strong opinion of this expert panel that colon cancer prevention should be the primary goal of colorectal cancer screening and the providers and patients should understand that non-invasive tests are less likely to prevent cancer compared with the invasive tests. Well, there's no evidence for this statement whatsoever. But of course, this had a big effect. 
So let's actually look at what they're recommending by putting that uh, warning about the menu of options into their guidelines. So let's, they already said that structural exams are better than stool tests, so we'll start with structural exams. Flexible sigmoidoscopy. Well, the use of flexible sigmoidoscopy has dropped dramatically since 2000, um, partially because colonoscopy was declared the best test, but more importantly because the government reimbursement for flexible sigmoidoscopy fell to levels below that which it cost for a doctor to do them in their own office. And, and over the same period of time, there's been a big increase in colonoscopy. What about double contrast barium That's the old uh, air contrast barium enema. Well, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I don't know any places that do this anymore. It's certainly never been proven to be a good screening test. And unfortunately, very little screening by colon can for colon cancer by this occurs in the United States. The utilization of this screening test is declining in the Medicare population, Department of Veterans Affairs, and in current clinical practice. CT colonography. Well, CT colonography is a good test. Um, it can find as many polyps and as cancers as does optical colonoscopy, but it needs to be done in very experienced hands, and it has some side effects or potential side effects that are worrisome, especially radiation exposure and false positive results. So CMS ruled against covering this test for Medicare patients, stating the evidence was inadequate to conclude that this was a test worthy of its uh, endorsement. And that continues today despite extensive lobbying. And the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines did not include CT colonography on this list of recommended screening tests. So we're left with the two fecal tests, which as you know, uh, they don't think much of. They think only uh, structural exams are good. So what these guidelines really recommend is colonoscopy. So, you know, when you start talking about uh, tests and you say one's the best and everything, there are consequences. Here's the aftermath of the results of the discussion about colonoscopy being the best test. In 2001, Congress bypassed CMS evaluation and added colonoscopy to the covered colon cancer screening test for Medicare patients by mandate. All other tests have had to go through CMS evaluation, but colonoscopy got a pass. And since Medicare's decision to reimburse for screening colonoscopy, some gastroenterologists, and I can say more than just some, are spending up to 50% of their practice time simply performing colonoscopy. And I ask you as patients, uh, as uh, family members, and as physicians, what would you rather have your gastroenterologist doing? Colonoscopies on mainly normal people, up to 85% of colonoscopies in average risk patient are completely normal. And of those that aren't normal, most of those findings are not significant. Would you rather have them doing that, or would you have them taking care of your patient, your family member who has severe gastrointestinal disease of some kind, like inflammatory bowel disease? And in terms of money, some commercial insurance plans are spending more every year on colonoscopies than on cardiac bypass, hip and knee, knee surgeries combined. So what we have in the United States, actually, is a fecal stampede, and this is well discussed in Lawson and Toby's article in Digestive Diseases and Sciences of 2008. So the other consequences are well described in this slide. This slide was presented at the NCI conference on colorectal cancer screening in 2010, and it's very informative. And what you see that has happened since 2000, and this can be, this goes out to 2012 actually, you can see that there's been a steady increase in overall screening in the United States from about below, just below 40 percent to now about 60 to 65 percent, as I mentioned. And that the test that's doing all the screening is predominantly colonoscopy whereas the other tests like flexible sigmoidoscopy and FOBT have fallen to historically low levels. So you might want to ask, well, if that's happening, how are the uninsured and underserved doing? And here would be your answer. This is the, and this also can be extended to 2008 and actually 2012, that basically those people with no insurance aren't getting any of this endoscopy, and those people with insurance are. So is colonoscopy the best screening test? Where's the beef? Let's get the evidence here. Now the best evidence would come from randomized controlled trials. And we don't have them, although two are in progress. One is in the United States in the VA system, and the other is in Spain. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one uh, in, the, in the next few minutes. So we don't have those. And when you don't have randomized controlled trials, you 
try to come to a conclusion as which test is best by using modeling. The modeling uses what the performance characteristics are of these tests. And in 2008, a decision analysis using two microsimulation models supported the idea that colorectal cancer screening with annual sensitive FOBT, which includes FIT, was as effective as colonoscopy screening every 10 years. And then something came out of the data since 2010 that was extremely interesting and somewhat counterintuitive. It actually showed that the protection of colonoscopy, screening colonoscopy against cancer, afforded by a negative colonoscopy was quite different in the right colon over by the appendix, 29 to 56% at most, than in the left colon, 80%. And after all, isn't colonoscopy what you're supposed to do to, to make a, a screening, not like a mammography on one breast? Well, here are the possible explanations. Many of these lesions on the right side are flat, they're pale, and difficult to identify and remove completely. And so the quality of the bowel preparation is often is very important, is often less optimal in the proximal colon. The other thing about the right colon and the left colon is that embryologically they're actually different. And proximal colorectal cancers are more likely to demonstrate this kind of genetic uh, pattern, microsatellite instability, BRAF mutation, and hygiene methylation compared with distal colorectal cancer. And therefore, they may grow faster and not be caught in an every 10-year colonoscopy uh, surveillance. So colorectal cancer surveillance recommendations are predicated upon a slow transition from adenoma to carcinoma, but this may not be true for right-sided neoplasms. So is colonoscopy the best screening test? Well, you have to also figure in when you're talking about uh, using screening colonoscopy is there's a risk. And here are some of the serious complications, and these detract from any benefit colonoscopy may have over the less invasive screening options. And evidence suggests that the manpower necessary to provide a skilled colonoscopic examination for all eligible U.S. citizens is inadequate. In a letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, a physician at Baylor College of Medicine estimated that screening their 62,008 patients, outpatients aged 50 years and older by colonoscopy would take about 30 years. Latterbaum and Song estimated that screening colonoscopy every 10 years would require 8.1 million colonoscopies per year, including surveillance, with other strategies requiring less colonoscopies. And Vijan and others estimated a need for as many as 33,000 more gastroenterologists in the country if the U.S. were to undertake population screening with optical colonoscopy. So when you have a test that gets a very nice reimbursement and you have way too many tests to be done, then you have people to do them, certain people may start reading certain kinds of books and they may get into the uh, idea that they can do colonoscopies as well as a well-trained gastroenterologist or colorectal surgeon. And then we get into more complications, not really achieving what we're trying to achieve uh, by doing screening. Now, last year, something very important happened, and I want to loud the American Cancer Society for this because they took a position with the Gastroenterology Society in 2008 that FOBT was not a good test because it was not a structural exam. But last year, after a lot of soul searching and a lot of looking at the evidence, they came out with this FOBT clinician's reference resource. And they said, FOBT has been shown to decrease both incidence and mortality from colorectal cancer. Modeling studies suggest years of life saved through a high quality FOBT screening program are the same as with a high quality colonoscopy screening program. These elements make FOBT a reasonable choice for patients. So let's now look at the 2008 U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines. Remember, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force employs people who are, are um, experts on evidence. Some of them may be uh, related to the subject, but others may not. They just are able to look at studies and tell which ones are good and which ones are bad and be able to give the best recommendation based on evidence as to what tests should be used for screening. And in their 2008 guidelines, they also divided the, uh, the tests into stool tests and structural exams, but they didn't say that one was better than the other. For the stool tests, they again recommended, as did the ACS Multisociety Task Force guidelines, not using regular standard hemocol 2 anymore, but going with a fecal immunochemical test or a sensitive guaiac test. And for structural exams, they only recommended two, sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. A couple interesting things about these guidelines are the following. 
you'll notice no fecal DNA recommendation. You'll see no CTC recommendation. You'll see no barium anima recommendation in these guidelines. Now, the, the, there are a couple of things that are innovative besides the new recommendations on the kind of fecal called blood tests. They suggested that flexible sigmoidoscopy, which should be done every five years, be uh, accompanied by a sense of guaiac test or FET every three years. And what this recognizes is that no test is perfect, and it also recognizes the possibility that some tests are, some cancers are faster growing than others. So you might miss something that would be found before it becomes fatal by doing a, a sensitive fit between uh, sigmoidoscopy intervals. Um, and you might also find it uh, because um, uh, there's a faster growth of that particular lesion. I don't know why they didn't do this for colonoscopy. I think they should have done it for colonoscopy too, but uh, they didn't. So we'll see what comes out in the next year or two. The other thing they did, which I think is very important, and it's been done in Europe for years, they put an upper limit on the age for screening. If you've been screened to age 75, uh, then your chance of dying from colorectal cancer is gigantically less than, it, uh, than from dying from some other things such as atherosclerotic heart disease, stroke, et cetera. The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends colorectal cancer screening on a case-by-case -case basis for healthy adults without significant lifetime life-limiting comorbidities between the ages of 75 and 85. And I think individualization is a good strategy in screening, and uh, you're seeing more and more of this now in the United States. I'm going to finish this part by uh, talking about uh, colonoscopy as the gold standard. And I'm going to be used as my uh, experts all the people, several people, who have recommended colonoscopy as being the best test. And as you may remember, Dr. Lieberman was the author of the article in 2000 in the New England Journal. And in 2004, under a title said, Colonoscopy is Good as Gold, he used Chaucer and he used Shakespeare to say the following at conclusion. Even under ideal conditions, colonoscopy is not perfect. Douglas Rex, a professor of medicine at the University of Indiana and a very strong proponent of screening colonoscopy and that being the best test, in, at least in the guidelines that he has helped published in the American College, of Gastro American College of Gastroenterology at the plenary session of the American Gastroenterology Association in 2009, the very most important session, he said the following, colonoscopy is the most common screening technique for colon cancer, but a better option might be the fecal immunochemical test, which could be easy, non-invasive, effective, low risk, and inexpensive. Dr. Kerry Klebunde from the Health Services and Economic Branch of the NCI took on the idea from the ACS Multisocity Task Force guidelines of 2008 that structural exams were better than um, fecal tests and said the following at the 2010 conference. Those guidelines state that tests providing a full structural exam of the colon are preferred over other tests. Not only do we lack randomized controlled trial data to warrant such a preference, but there is evidence that other screening options that use colonoscopy as a diagnostic follow-up test can play a role in systems that achieve high screening rates. And finally, just last year, the American College of Physicians, the premier group for internists in the United States, said the following about screening for colon cancer. Shared decision-making is important when selecting a screening test because the currently available colorectal cancer screening tests are believed to be similarly efficacious. So now I want to get into FIT a little bit, and I make the assertion, which I think many of you in, in Maine will agree with, that the, there's not a great reputation for fecal occult blood tests in the United States. So in my opinion, they're like Rodney Dangerfield. They just don't get no respect. Now, what are the FOBT options? Well, if you remember from the guideline recommendations I've already uh, put up on the screen, there are basically two. That is a sensitive guaiac test and a FIT. And there are a lot of points to be made on this slide. First of all, the price is really important. And I can tell you that although this price is what the CMS said that it would pay for this, that you can get it for much less, and I know that your leaders know how to do that. The second thing is that this test, the sensitive GWIAC test, detects peroxidase activity. It requires three tests to be done uh, for each patient. And the peroxidase activity is found in human blood, non-human blood, at fruits and vegetables. And it can be altered if you take vitamin C. So lots of problems with this in terms of getting it right. And I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's really a practical test to be using. And I don't think it's going to be around much longer. On the other hand, the FIT, what it detects is human globin. It has uh, 
antibodies to the epitopes of globin, and it detects them in the stool. So it's a very specific tool for finding blood and human blood in the, in the colon. Now, these other examples here show that there's different ways of collection. Here's a stick, here's a brush, here's a little pike, a little spear. And you'll also see that some have cards. This is called dry sampling to put the sample on, and some have liquid. This is buffer for uh, a wet sampling. And all of these things make one test better than another uh, for individual populations. And we can discuss those more as we, uh, in our discussion section. So here's what people who don't want fit to be used in the United States have to say. If used, the opportunity for colorectal cancer prevention is limited and incidental. I'll show you that's not true. Screening for cold blood has been proven to be an inherently insensitive and nonspecific marker for screen-relevant neoplasia, which means it doesn't find advanced adenomas or cancers. Repeated testing is required and unlikely to be done. The repeated testing part is true. Unlikely to be done doesn't have to be so. And it is not the most effective screening strategy. Now, if you don't think that this is still alive and well, all you need to do is look at the results from the first uh, controlled trial, randomized controlled trial of colonoscopy versus fecal immunochemical test, which is going on in Spain and was uh, published in the uh, New England Journal this past year and was commented on in an editorial by Dr. Bradhauer, who's in charge of a colonoscopy screening program and actually had funding from both colonoscopy manufacturers and from uh, the PrEP manufacturers. And Dr. Bredhauer uh, said, the yield for adenomas in the FIT group was low, which indicates that FIT is not a good test for detecting adenomas. Well, I know that Dr. Bredhauer knows otherwise. You cannot compare a one-shot test like colonoscopy to a programmatic testing program of repeated FIT. And remember, if, even if it doesn't find as many adenomas on the first shot, it has multiple chances for finding it over number, numerous uh, tests, and these are not cancers. These are adenomas. So uh, I'm going to show you some more data now to explain this. These are two studies of two FIT and show you what the sensitivity is for these advanced adenomas. These, these are the ones that are most likely to become cancer. And you can see the sensitivity, which means if you had 100 patients with this an advanced adenoma, you would find 20 using this fit on one shot, and using this fit, you'd find 34. It doesn't seem like much, but remember, it gets repeated and repeated. And in, in screening settings where this has been done over time, uh, all the cancers are eliminated within three years. The adenomas continue, but again, I want to point out that adenomas are not cancers. As far as it being a nonspecific marker for screen-relevant neoplasia, we have data from quantitative fit. Now, the FIT that are used in the United States, and in most countries, actually, are qualitative FIT. They give you a yes-no answer. The positive or negative is determined upon uh, a cutoff point of FIT of blood detection that's determined by the manufacturer. But in this particular test, they use what the actual blood amount was in this study. And you can see it was only 35 nanograms per ml in the normal, but as much as 500 in advanced adenomas, as much as 1,000 in the early cancers, and as much as 1,400 in the late cancers. So very specific um, marker for screen-relevant neoplasia. And finally, this is a study from Scotland showing that you can get people to come back. This is a study using the standard GUIAC test, which is much more difficult to do and much less preferred by most patients than the FIT test. And they had 304,000 patients originally. They bumped it up. Some people joined after the second round and after the third round, but it stayed pretty much level the whole time. So you can do it, and this has been shown to be true in FIT studies, although they don't have the length of time of follow-up that this particular study has. So here's a little bullet point to remember about FIT and 101. These are the advantages of FIT over other fecal blood tests superior sensitivity for colorectal cancer and superior specificity for colorectal cancer and advanced adenoma. You don't need to di restrict the diet like you, do f you should for guaiac, especially the sensitive guaiac. It's specific for colorectal bleeding. And why is that? Because remember, these tests uh, have epitopes to the 
globin molecule. The globin molecule is chewed to bits going from the stomach down to the colon, so upper GI bleeding won't be recognized by these, uh, epito by these uh, antibodies. So it's very specific for colorectal bleeding. It can be developed and interpreted by automation, which I think is a tremendous advance, I'm, and I hope eventually you can get to automation. And specimen collection allows for less stool handling, which means more patient participation. So I know you want me to answer this question, and it's a, it's a difficult answer. Uh, you saw that I have no connection, financial or otherwise, to any of these companies. But it, you might want to know that, um, that there is one that has had a lot of evidence behind it, and some that have some evidence. The ones that have some evidence are Insure and, uh, and the Hemocult ICT, and the one that has a lot of evidence is the Polymedco, where that company has gone out in many different countries, and there's lots of studies showing how effective it is. And this is the one that's being used in Kaiser Permanente, in the VA study, in the Spanish study, and throughout many countries in the world. And what can you do with a FIT? Well, this doesn't exactly uh, fit, pardon the pun, your experience in Maine, but in Kaiser, where we have 3 million people in Northern California, in 2010, they sent out 450,000 kits. They had a 53% uh, return rate, 60% the next year, positivity rate about 5.4%, and they've been detecting 200 more cancers each year than at the beginning of the FIT program, and colorectal cancers detected are mostly early stage cancers. You also can see that when they in initiated FIT testing, when they found that they could not, and this is an important lesson, they could not keep up with the rates demanded by HEDIS for, screen, for the screened population by continuing to do an endoscopy uh, approach to screening, which was flexible signal endoscopy, that their covered population had been screened 85% in 2011, it's above 90 now, and 75% for the commercial population. And these are way above most rates in the United States. And most intriguingly, this is from Southern California, where they screened 640,000 patients since uh, 2005. They have uncovered 5,100 cancers. They've increased their screening rates dramatically, and they are finding that the cancers they find are more increasing in the stage one, the curable cancers, than in the late stage cancers. So my summary is this. FIT FOBT is a colorectal cancer screening test with proven effectiveness for both early detection and prevention. It is a cheap, effective, and currently available way to estimate absolute risk for individual persons so that screening colonoscopy may be more efficiently targeted to those who actually have something important. Effective repeated screenings can be achieved in large average risk population, and as of 2013, fecal blood remains the best stool marker for advanced neoplasms and cancer. It is unrealistic to believe that any one screening test will detect all advanced neoplasms, and in some cases, it's not important that they're detected the first time because you're going to be doing multiple times uh, over a course of a, a programmatic screening. Decisions on how to population screen for colon cancer should take into consideration upfront costs, patient preferences, and the potential risk of screening tests for otherwise healthy people. As screening has been demonstrated to save lives, any evidence-based, guideline-recommended test should be acceptable at this time. So, can we, with good conscience, recommend screening tests other than colonoscopy to our average risk patients, including perhaps our mother? Well, I hope that my talk has convinced you that we can, but just in case, uh, I went to a higher authority and he said, yes, we can. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Allison. That's a really great presentation and I think gives us a lot to think about and bring back with us. Um, so right now we're opening up the chat box for any questions that you have, or if you'd like to raise your hand, we can take you off of mute as well. And just to uh, the first question about slide deck, we will be providing the slide deck um, via PDF after the fact. And uh, but one thing I'd like to ask you, Dr. Allison, we have a range of uh, providers and um, groups on the line. But I was wondering if you could speak at least at the start to the evidence in FQHCs and especially uh, low-income populations. I think one thing that the main colorectal cancer control program and MPCA are working to do is really, as you showed earlier, get those low-income and perhaps uninsured or underinsured folks screened better. 
So if you could speak to that at first, that'd be great. Yes, I'll be glad to. Um, it's very exciting, actually. Um, California was one of the few states that took the CDC money um, that was used to uh, help try to solve this problem and come up with a plan. And the plan was to start using fit outreach in the uninsured, underserved population. And uh, I work at San Francisco General, so I, uh, I helped them uh, get in touch with the people that were doing that. And in a uh, pilot study in one of the clinics in what is called the uh, community health network that serves the uninsured underserved, they showed that they could increase their screening rates dramatically by using FIT over the standard FOBT. Uh, after more evidence came in and uh, we upgraded our databases at San Francisco General Hospital to get the CDC kind of information that they wanted, um, we have now initiated a, um, a full court press. We no longer do screening colonoscopies at San Francisco General. We only do colonoscopies on patients who are FIT positives. I can tell you that our colonoscopy rates has, as you would expect, increased, but uh, I'm hopeful to show soon that it also increased the positive predictive value of, and, and discovered a lot more cancers in polyps. This has been shown, as I already showed in the Kaiser data, but not yet uh, in um, on the uninsured underserved, but I don't see any reason why it, it wouldn't be as good. In fact, I think since many of those have never been screened at all, that this will be, um, that they'll have a high yield of cancers and polyps in their uh, study population. Now we've also gone over to Alameda County Medical Center across the bay, which is also uh, a safety net hospital. And they have, they were on a, program of screening colonoscopy and they weren't they weren't even touching the population there very few people got screened in a year and they were still doing lots of colonoscopies uh, so they went to a fit based program and they have already in one year passed their goals they've gone up about 20 percent in the first year they've actually met 30 percent which is their second year goal of screening that was down around four or five percent or 10 percent at the most and I had those slides, uh, I, I just got those slides yesterday, I didn't have time to, to make those uh, into something I could show you today. Now there are other programs uh, around the country that are, are doing that as well. We have now a consortium of uh, university people who are interested in doing this in their uninsured, underserved populations. There's their bases in uh, Dallas, Texas under UT Southwestern. Um, there, uh, there's other places uh, such as in Florida and um, I'm going to forget some, I'm sure, but uh, there are a lot of places where this is happening, and everywhere it's happening, the rate, the screening rates have gone up dramatically. Great. Thanks so much. Um, one other question came in via chat. How many FIT tests are considered a screen? Okay, that's a, an important question. Um, so uh, the data on the number of FIT that you actually need to do is uh, has been somewhat debatable, but it, it, you, it, you don't. Most people who aren't into this field, like I am, know about the debate. Um, the evidence that had been out there showed that FIT was better done if you did two tests instead of one test. And some of the manufacturers of FIT in the United States are recommending two tests now. They used to recommend three tests. Um, it turns out that um, one test is probably perfect, especially if you do. Um, you do it over, uh, you know, you keep repeating it over time. Um, I don't want to get into too much of this uh, scientific stuff, but I can tell you that uh, in Europe they do it every two years and they don't have any problems, and I think we can actually extend the number. But in the United States, uh, a simple answer to that question is one test is necessary, and that also helps a lot for, um, you know, getting acceptance of screening. I can also tell you that there's one of my fellows is working on a paper that hopefully will be published um, in the next two or three months, and he showed that the actual difference between an one and two, te one, two, and three tests really has more to do with what the cutoff of this test was than the uh, actual number of tests. So if you had a low cutoff, you didn't miss anything uh, for a positive test. If you had high cutoff, you may miss some things, and maybe more than one test would be um, uh, better. Great, thank you. Um, another kind of bigger picture question that just came in via chat is if you have any input on how will Obamacare affect access to colorectal cancer screening? Will well, this, this is a, yeah. go ahead. Oh, and then the second part was will this impact the manpower problem you spoke of earlier? 
Um, well, uh, this is a great question, and I would love to elicit support from everybody on the call on this. Um, as I told you, uh, colonoscopy was mandated as being covered by Medicare in 2000 by Congress, and, and I know you have a lot of respect for Congress, um, but um, uh, there was no evidence behind it. And so as the Obama health care plan was uh, envisioned for screening, it, the first thing they said is, um, you know, on the basis of lots of uh, uh, input from gastroenterologists, got to cover colonoscopy as a screening test. So, of course, it covered col colonoscopy. However, to their horror, the gastroenterologists found out that it did not cover a colonoscopy that was done as a screening test and found polyps or cancers in it. Then it became a diagnostic colonoscopy and the government wouldn't pay for it. So huge lobbying groups have gone to Congress and they got that fixed only in the last week. But unfortunately, there was nobody advocating, well, there were people advocating, but they weren't being heard um, about the the, the underserved, uninsured population and, and people who decide they don't want to have a colonoscopy, they want to have a fit test. So in their wisdom, whatever it is, probably because somebody who really didn't know much about this wrote the law, said that if you do a fit, they'll pay for the fit if it's negative, and if it's positive, you have to pay for the colonoscopy. Now, all of us are working very, very hard to change this, and including one gastroenterology site, the American Gastroenterology Association, is working very hard to do this. So I've been in contact with um, uh, people. I'm hoping to be able to talk with actually some representatives of Governor Brown in California next week at Lobby Day, and um, we're hoping that this will be changed. I'm mildly optimistic uh, that this is going to be changed. As far as the numbers, if, if everybody gets screening colonoscopies, we're not going to have the manpower to you know, to deal with that uh, you know, under Obamacare. Care. What I think is going to happen is, in addition to saying that colonoscopy is covered, they're going to say, okay, it's covered, but you're going to get what it's really worth, two hundred dollars. You're not going to get five hundred. You're not going to get two thousand. You're not going to get five thousand. And they'll be screaming and yelling and hair pulling, but uh, all of a sudden the fit will become very, very important to them because they'll know they'll only be doing colonoscopies, and those people most likely to have something that's important. Great. Thank you, Dr. Allison. And I think that's a really great reminder. I'm sure Christy would say the same, that everybody should make sure that you're enrolling eligible patients into the main colorectal cancer control program so that they can uh, have access to colonoscopies if uh, they need it and they may not have those extra costs incurred. Uh, and one potential uh, thought that we had is to promote enrolling patients, if you are doing fit, if patients are, are eligible, enroll them into the state colorectal cancer control program before you do the FIT, and then if it turns out positive, the state program would cover the colonoscopy. Now, this is a very, very important point you're just making here, and this is a problem we have in California, is that we're doing great in the safety net hospitals, but in places where there isn't a safety net hospital, you know, no, none of the private uh, people are willing to take up the cost of colonoscopy and the cost of care if you find a cancer. And that has to be in place before you start screening a population. And uh, that is the biggest, the biggest barrier to screening and disparities uh, equality that I know of. Well, thanks so much for that. Uh, I, you know, I think unless you have any other parting words, that's a great place to end as we uh, Again, really appreciate your time and your, your expertise and, you know, look forward to supporting all of our practices and promoting these best practices moving forward and increasing access to colorectal cancer screening. Well, thanks so much for that opportunity. It was, it was really delightful. Great. Thanks. And everybody have a great day.